In the previous section, we were able to predict the microstructure of steels, but we had to do this kind of crazy thing where we said that we could instantaneously change the temperature of a steel, right? It went from 900 degrees all the way down to 600, then instantly down to 400, and that's just not the real life. In real life, you take your piece of metal and you dump it into like a quenching medium, and it's going to lose its temperature, but it's going to lose so continuously. It's not going to be a step function. It's going to slowly change temperature. So what we really need in reality is continuous cooling transformation, right? Something's going to continuously cool. So we call these CCT diagrams, and they're just slightly modified versions of TTT diagrams to represent the real world. So in these ones, here you've got your temperature, you've got your time, and you've got your curves representing transformations. These are these big solid black lines representing different transformations, right? You've got A plus E, so austenite plus ferrite or cementite, um, and so forth. But what's different here is that now you've got these lines representing different cooling rates, right? So now you've got a 2.9 degrees per uh, degrees per second. Here you've got 1.28. Here's really aggressive cooling, 46 degrees Celsius per second, right? These lines represent different things, and you can see where they cross these regions. And using the uh, beginning and end of these transformations, you could figure out what sort of microstructures you achieve using these continuous cooling transformation diagrams. By the way, we just said that these are continuous cooling, meaning it's cooling at a constant rate, but these don't look like straight lines. The only reason they don't look like straight lines is because we're plotting the x-axis uh, on the log scale. If it was on a linear scale, these would look like straight lines, okay? Um, something to note is that steels that have less than 0.25 weight percent carbon, you actually cannot form martensite. You'd have to quench it way too quickly than what you can achieve. So if you want to form martensitic steels, you have to have a little bit more carbon. And on that struct and on that subject, let's talk a little bit about what happens as you change the uh, amount of carbon in your steels with their properties, right? Well, what's going to happen to the strength, hardness, and, and tensile strength, hardness, and yield strength? They're all going to increase. Why do they do that? Well, think about it. It's the same reason why the impact energy, reduction area, and elongation are all going to decrease. If we look at our phase diagram, the phase diagram tells us that we have our eutectoid temperature, right? We've got our eutectoid composition right here, and that in this region, we end up with a mixture of ferrite plus cementite, Fe3C. And the further over this way we are, the more of this cementite we end up with. Remember, cementite is the ceramic here. It's a carbide, whereas ferrite is a ductile metal. So as you increase carbon content, what you're doing is you're moving it this way towards the ceramic. So sure enough, yeah, strength, hardness, you know, these are going to increase, but at the expense of your ductility, right? And you can see that in these plots. Here they're plotting hardness for martensitic steels, and when you increase carbon content, all the way up to here, you see it rises until it basically saturates. Tempered martensite, the same thing. Fine perlite, the same thing. And this, by the way, is the same trend we saw before, going from perlite to tempered martensite to martensite. You see this strengthening and hardening effect, right? Now, why is martensite so strong and hard? Because it really is. It's like the hardest, strongest steel that you can make. So what makes it so? Well, when you switch from austenite to martensite, there's actually a change in volume the volume of the martensite is larger than the austenite. And so when you quench it and it switches to this slightly new structure, it increases a little bit, and that puts cracks in your material. Um, this is especially bad if your carbon content is greater than 0.5 weight percent, right? And you can think why that is, because if you go back up to our um, martensitic structure with the body center tetragonal, what you're doing is all of these little red atoms here, those are your carbons that are stuffed in there, if you increase it beyond 0.5 weight percent, you're filling lots and lots of those. So nobody ever uses martensite as quenched. Instead, they always do a tempering step, right? You temper it. You do a heat treatment at some low temperature to help recover some of this internal stress that came about due to the volume change in your material, right? Um, uh, another way to think of that is that martensite is a single phase, but tempered martensite, it actually becomes a composite. It's an ultra-fine dis dispersion of ferrite within your and cementite. Um, so these are little tiny spheres instead of lamella forming, right? Because this doesn't have to happen instantly. This can happen at low temperatures, so it happens slowly, right? Um, another thing you can do is that you can do differential tempering to d get different colors as you uh, temper things for different amounts of time, you're allowing it to oxidize on the surface. So what you're seeing here as it goes from white through this brownish, blue, purple, you know, to gray, what you're actually seeing is the thickness of the oxide layer that's forming along this. We know that steel um, 
it's thermodynamically favorable for it to form an oxide. And so the oxide that forms is going to be, you know, something. And the thickness of that oxide will depend on the temperature and the time in the furnace. And the thickness also changes the color. Like these would have different colors uh, depending on the thickness because it's how the light interacts with this oxide layer, right? And so you can actually do some really cool blacksmithing projects where you know that parts of your sword are going to um, be at different temperatures because you quench it and the thin parts are going to cool down more quickly. So they're going to have a different color and look than the thicker parts, which are going to quench uh, more slowly because there's more thermal mass there. And so what you're seeing here is evidence of the the fact that you have different rates of heat leaving your material as a function of different thicknesses.